Welcome to season two of my Iron Tusk documentaries. This season will feature a storied history of pop culture covering movies, TV shows, bands, and the 1990s. And the 1990s were rich in culture, music, television, and movies. We had music such as the Macarena, the Forgotten Spice Girls, the television shows like Star Trek, Stargate, and Babylon 5. Movies like Speed, Independence Day, Twister, Fifth Element, and finally, cartoons such as Gargoyles, Sailor Moon, Captain Planet, and yes, finally, Mighty Max. Mighty Max was my favorite 90 show when I was a kid, and I would watch every episode every morning, and yes, even dreamed of being the cat bearer himself, despite not being named Max. Although I was friends with a neighbor who was named Max and was aware of my affinity for the show. Sadly, that neighbor of mine that I remember as a kid whose name was Max had died suddenly at a young age in a car accident not too long ago. The series has put a large imprint in my life and made a references to pop culture as well. It's ironic. Virgil even stated on the show that every person has a gift, and in that gift lies their destiny. My gift was a digital creativity, video editing, audio editing, and photography. It seemed like I was destined to make this documentary on Mighty Max. But what is the show about? How did the show come to be? Well, first off, Mighty Max was a series of toys that were manufactured by Blue Board Toys PLC in the United Kingdom in 1992 and was designed by Big Monster Toys. The toys were similar to the early Polly Pocket toy line in Canada and the United States. They were distributed by Irwin Toy Limited and Mattel Incorporated, respectively. The original toy line consisted mainly of Doom Zones horror heads, and these Doom Zones were small playsets with horror theme and featured miniature figurines of menacing creatures and the hero Max, a young boy with blonde hair, jeans, and a white teeth with the letter M in red on it, and a baseball cap with a color varied based on the playset purchased, which also had an M on it as well. The horror heads were similar to smaller sized playset, also shaped like the heads of creatures and contained miniature figures as well. It was later adopted to the TV series as well as a tie-in video game produced by Ocean Software for the Super Nintendo and the Mega Drive Sega Genesis as well. The storyline gave rise to a cartoon series along other tie-ins. The series follows Max, an adventurous preteen boy who is chosen to be the cat bearer. The cat is capable of projecting wormhole-like portals through which Max can teleport across space and time, while generally lighthearted and comical. The show's violence and description of violent acts were considered excessive by some viewers. Many episodes began with a depiction of stories of a principal monster killing a victim in all episodes. There is a short ending scene, which preludes the credits. This is known as an educational scene where Max is showing at his desk in his room, where he discusses with the audience some of the aspects of the ed episode in an educational way, similar to other children's cartoon series at the time, including the Magic School Bus. Usually, the location where the events took place, etc., occasionally Max is shown in another setting, such as a library or a museum. This is simply heard recorded on an answering machine, as well such as Armageddon Out of Here episode, the series finale. However, these sequences were not broadcasting in some regions, such as Britain, generally the educational messages at the end of each show were not the reminder, brush your teeth, type used in some action cartoons of the same time. Instead, the message was generally scientific, historical, and cultural significance. It is probably something that has drawn upon my influences for these documentaries today. But for example of these references in the show, the mythology of another culture, the new astronomical theories of the time, or in fact that the Native Americans were the first believed to be the Indians by European explorers. These ending scenes were typical of 90s cartoons at the time. And after the series began to air, the characters Virgil and Norman, the toys based on the episodes of the series, were added to the toy line to form a new series. The story was packaged and revised accordingly, and the short-lived comic book series by Marvel was created as well. The appearance of Max changed considerably as he was no longer portrayed as a young boy, but a taller adolescent with longer hair, untucked shirt, similar to his portrayal in the television series. However, the older Doom Zones, the horror heads, and the playsets were re-released with the original story and replaced with the revised one stated that Max was a bright and pretty good at getting in out of trouble, but he'd never forget the day when he broke his mom's mysterious old statue and found the cosmic cap inside. How he know to know it made him the mighty one, able to travel instantly from place to place by means of time portals. But how were Max and his cosmic cap and his two friends and protectors, wise old Virgil and fearless Norman, going to measure up against the ultimate evil of Skullmaster? However, the TV show series premiere of Mighty Max emphasized that the stone statue was made for Mighty Max and not for his mother. Now, I'm not sure if this was intentional to steer away from the original storyline of the toy line series or a slip up 
but I will probably lean towards the former rather than the latter. But like all shows and films, Mighty Max is a history in its show, a storied history as you will, which is considered part of canon or non-canon or beta canon, as some people would say. During the storied history of the show, the cosmic caps became the crowns when worn by Lemurians and Atlanteans, and a cap was worn by Mighty Max was created by the ancient ones who resided there, where in Antarctica is today, over one million years ago, who were known as the ancient gods in Lemuria and Atlantis. Lemuria and Atlantis were founded by societies known as the Nephilim, who were rumored to be the offspring of the ancient ones and the daughters of men. In around 200,000 BC, but by 70,000 BC, the caps were found, and just at the time when humanity was making its marks on the world, after bouncing back from its first cataclysms, such as the supervolcano in Lake Toba, most Lemurians believed that these cosmic caps to be sacred relics, and set out to collect them all and preserve them, and prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. And during the Great Cataclysm of 26,000 BC, and one Lemurian soldier turned on his people and killed millions of ancient Lemurians. All but one of the cap was lost forever. One of the few Lemurians who survived the massacre fled from the earthen plain and only two Lemurians were left, Skullmaster and Virgil, and the first mighty one, one of the only vestiges of humanity left in Lemuria. Virgil and the first mighty one were able to defeat Skullmaster by imprisoning him in a chamber long enough for the duo to escape to a portal out of Lemuria and into a remote part of the world. Once Skullmaster escaped the enclosed sacred chamber inside, he escaped with his dragon and mounted to search for the Mighty One and Virgil. In around 10,000 years ago, a human was born in Scandinavia with extraordinary strength. He would be known as Norman in the series, which means Northman. He would often go on adventures with his father until his father was older, where he'd settle down and long for peace and fellowship with other Norse tribes. However, that changed when Spike came and ended up killing Norman's father. Fortunately for Norman, Spike would face his temporary end under the ice before being rediscovered in 1993 by archaeologists. Before the dawn of mankind in 8000 BC, Skullmaster was looking to find the Mighty One. He sent the people of Atlantis words of prophecy that whipped the people into fear, believing their end was nigh. The, in Atlantis, Skullmaster built the Crystal of Souls. He tricked the people of Atlantis and giving their souls to it to power the crystal in order to save themselves of the coming disaster. However, the people were reluctant, and Skullmaster unleashed a flood on the city, which the people were reluctantly to save their own souls were transferred to Skullmaster's Crystal of Souls. But in around 3000 BC, Skullmaster had instructed his servants in Celtica to create a monument in his honor and channel his power to control time and space, according to the Lemurian Arcana. The change in the seasons coupled with the Crystal of Souls' power and the power of the Cosmic Cap would allow Skullmaster to have unimaginable power over time and space itself. There was one problem, however. He had to find the Cosmic Cap, which he still had yet to do so. So he and his dragon furiously searched for the Mighty One and Virgil. Finally, Skullmaster had eventually caught up with the Mighty One and Virgil and cornered them in a wilderness area, what is now known as San Francisco today, where Max's home would be built in 5,000 years. Skullmaster used the Crystal Souls to control the bodies of Atlanteans to attack the Mighty One there. While being powered by their souls themselves, the Mighty One would was able to trick Skullmaster into the portal to the center of the earth, where Skullmaster followed the Mighty One in. Once in the center of the earth, Skullmaster killed the former cat bearer by throwing him over into the great chasm below into a molten lake, and he turned his attention to Lava Lord, where he used the power of the Crystal of Souls to trap Lava Lord in a prison, a stone prison, if you will, and then he would turn his Crystal of Souls power to turn his lava minions into slaves, as well as stone men, into his power. There he met Warmonger, who would become his greatest servant as well. Warmonger was used to be the servant of Lava Lord before being touched by the Crystal of Souls, becoming Skullmaster's most trusted servant. And during the next 5,000 years, Skullmaster, Warmonger, and their minions would attempt to escape the earthly prison of the underworld. Now, during that time on the Earth, Norman and his tribe, who people once called him Thor, eventually was fighting another tribe who raised a demon known as Lakia. He's there, he fought the great demon Lakia and was known as a demon of violence. And despite Norman's strength, he could not kill the demon. But despite the demon's seemingly immortal essence, he could not best Norman. During this battle between Norman and Lakia, Lakia could not best Norman. And the angry he got, the more his rage made him go insane. His insanity let out a deafening scream so powerful that it blew eardrums miles away and destroying snowcaps off mountains. The villagers and the armies of strangers that raised the demon banded together to capture Lakia and banished him to the farthest reaches of sea so the gods would take him back. Though the next few millennia 
Virgil meets with Norman, and they prepare for the arrival of the next Mighty One. But also, during their many exploits and containing Skullmaster's minions over the years, Norman has taken the legends of many cultures, such as being Samson, Thor, Hercules, and many more. Around 500 years ago in Cascadia, Norman came to face to face with Lockia once again. Despite impeccable odds, Norman was able to once again defeat him, and Virgil and Norman trapped the evil demon in a sacred tree. He hid his axe under a mountain and a key under a lake, hoping it would never be found. During their exploits in Rangoon, a disaster occurred that almost cost Norman his life. As him and Virgil were looking for the Lemurian Arcana, they faced off against the Lemurian Deathstalker. This Deathstalker was extremely powerful and an ancient Lemurian guardian that protected sacred technology and artifacts from those who would try to steal it. And to this day, that incident still scars the memory of Norman and Virgil. Prophesying the coming return of Lao Shu, Norman and Virgil set out upon to find a map of the maze where Lao Shu and his minions would gather to take over the world. In China, Norman and Virgil constructed many different ways to lay clues for the Mighty One in case when the time is right to use them against Lao Shu. And in 1993, their prophecy came into be when a fatherless Max receives a gift from a mysterious individual. When Max opens the box, he discovers a statue of Virgil with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. This statue read, You have been chosen to be the cap bearer. Go to the mini mart and wait for a sign, Mighty Max. Mighty Max was shocked at this message and the stone statue fell to the floor, breaking upon impact, and he sees a cap. Awed by the cap and the make of it, he put it on his head, thinking it's just a normal cap. But once he put it on his head, strange things happened, which alerted Skullmaster and Skull Mountain that the cap bearer has been found. Upon arriving at the mini mart, he is chased by a lava monster sent by Skullmaster, who is attempted to retrieve the cap bearer and his cap. But this Skullmaster, a megalomaniac ancient Lemurian who lives within the earth, has the power to create evil minions. And as Max races away, the cap activates a portal which transports him instantly from his current location, which is in San Francisco, to the Mongolian desert, where Max is met by Virgil, a nearly ominous Lemurian, whose appearance of that as an anamorphic fowl, which is a running gag everybody thinks is a chicken, but he's a fowl, actually. Virgil explains that Max's reception of the cap was prophesied 5,000 years ago. Max, Virgil, and Norman, and his vo also known as his Viking bodyguard, which is three times larger than Max, travel together around the world defending Earth against the minions of Skullmaster, who is responsible for the downfall of the Lemurians and the Atlanteans. Norman is supposedly immortal and unstoppable, and has improvised of being in various legends, such as Sir Lancelot, Thor, Samson, and Hercules. Throughout the year, in 1993, they would face many challenges of many Skullmaster's minions, such as the reawakening of the Doom Dragon, and also the Atlanteans would make their appearance once again as slaves to Skullmaster, and attempting to steal Max's cap. Virgil was not happy about this as Max and Norman attempted to attack and defeat the Atlantean zombies who could not be killed and could not be stopped. So he took the cap away from Max and tried to run away in order to save Max and Norman. Virgil was hoping to maybe destroy the cap even though it was considered to be indestructible, but no one's has ever tried and no one's ever done it before. When Max and Norman caught up with Virgil with the Atlanteans in tow, Virgil attempted to destroy the cap but was struck, and then Max and Norman tried to save Virgil from an, a lightning strike that would kill him and possibly destroy the cap. An ensuing battle between the Atlanteans, Norman and Max and Virgil, they were able to lure all of the Atlanteans to the bottom of the ocean through a portal. They, Norman and Virgil thought Max was gone when they found out that the portal that they sent the Atlanteans to was at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. But Max was okay because he used Norman's sword to anchor himself to protect him from falling into that portal to his doom. Later on, that event and that day would haunt Max and would cause him to experience nightmares of being chased by mindless Atlantean zombies who would come to try to destroy and kill him in his dreams. He would confront Virgil and Norman about these premonitions, which would later be stated that they were just the crystal souls trying to torment Max into giving up the cap and quest. And Max almost nearly tries to give up his quest to be the cap bearer, but by summoning heroes of old, such as Hanuman the Monkey King and many others, to fight Skullmaster on Skull Mountain while he destroyed the Crystal of Souls. In doing so, Skullmaster was enraged by the destruction of the Crystal and he sent all of his minions in his entire underworld after Max and his heroes. Max and Norman and Virgil were able to barely escape with their lives and many of the heroes that had fought with him had died allowing Max to escape. Max was distraught and he was almost unable to recover from this day as well as many days before that. So in turn, about a week later, he went to Virgil telling them that he wants to give him back the cap and that he's tired 
of being the cat bearer and risking his life all the time to fight something he think he cannot win. But when Virgil and Norman was able to convince Mighty Max that he could stop Skullmaster once and for all, if they could sneak into Skull Mountain since the Crystal Souls has been destroyed, that Skullmaster would be most vulnerable and it would be the easiest to take him out. By the time they got to Skull Mountain, Skullmaster was already preparing an attack against Lava Lord, who was freed from his prison after the Crystal Souls was destroyed. And Skullmaster sent his minions to attack Lava Lord, and in doing so, when Max and Norman and Virgil teleported to the Underworld, they were teleported in the midst of of a battle between Lava Lord and Skullmaster, which unwittingly put them into Skullmaster's crosshairs, and thus their surprise attack would be thwarted. In doing so, Virgil was captured, and Norman and Max tended to escape, hoping maybe to go back to the overworld and hoping to see about maybe finding another strategy to take Skullmasters out while saving their friend Virgil. However, Lava Lord requested the presence of the Mighty One and Norman to find out what they were doing in the underworld. Once they found out, who Lava Lord was, Lava Lord introduced himself as well as his new weapon of mass destruction called Magus, a very large, 20 foot tall mecha warrior who could be controlled either by remote or by controls inside the machine to destroy Skullmaster. This instrument of destruction would be used to attack Skull. Skullmaster used Virgil as a human shield and warned Max that if he were to try to kill Skullmaster, he would kill Virgil as well. But according to prophecy during the, the last of the Lemurians, if one Lemurian is to die, the other one must die as well. So if Skullmaster were to die, Virgil would die as well. In doing so, Max couldn't couldn't make a difficult decision. And Skullmaster told Max that if he would release all of them into the outer world, that he would let them live. Max, faced with a difficult choice, decided that he would abandon Magus and then jump to the portal to the overworld, where Norman, Virgil, Warmonger, and Skullmaster followed suit. Lava Lord, attempting to retake Magus from Max and Norman, decided to try to attack them with his minions, but in doing so, destroyed Magus, and they were failed to in their objective to stop Max. When they reached the overworld, Skullmaster's pet, who was asleep for many millennia, was awakened when Skullmaster returned to the overworld, and they escaped to, another, to fight another day, while Virgil scolded Max for allowing Skullmaster to be freed to destroy the world once again. Mighty Max was deeply saddened by this and attempted to apologize to Virgil, but Virgil assured him that sometimes the right way is also the most difficult way, and that he will be the mighty one for a very long time. They would combat Skullmaster's minions in different islands, as well as Skullmaster luring a bunch of tribes together to become his next minions, just like he did the Atlanteans. And in doing so, these minions attacked Max and Virgil, and his dragon almost nearly killed Norman. But Norman survived and was very angry and wanted a piece of Skullmaster. In another instance, though, he attempted to use the Lemurian Arcana, which he stole from Lemuria, and used another Max to attempt to deceive Virgil and Norman into thinking that Mighty Max was not the true Mighty One, that it belonged to somebody else. Though the Lemurian Arcana was in Skullmaster's hands, many of the pages were, were taken and stolen, which raged Skullmaster. However, some of the pages used was able to be used against the two-headed Hydra Dragon on a remote island in the Atlantic Ocean at zero degrees longitude and zero degrees latitude. This, however, allowed Max, with his pages that he stole, to control the dragons and stop Skullmaster. However, Warmonger decided to use this moment to seize power and opportunity to become a master himself, and he nearly defeated Skullmaster, but in doing so, the Lemurian Arcana has many powers and deceivable nature that only just transported Skullmaster into his realm. But when Warmonger found out, Skullmaster actually congratulated him for his deviousest ploy and that he would be the perfect servant for Skullmaster. Later on in the series, Max and Norman and Virgil would fight against many of Skullmaster's minions that would be so powerful that he might even scare Norman as well. Many instances were such, such as the incident in Rangoon was always brought up, especially during the incident called Serious Trouble, where the aliens of Serious B came and stole toxic waste from nuclear power plants. But also at the end, when the Winter Solstice was coming, fears amounted with Virgil and Norman as they knew their dooms were coming, and that Max's actions that led to this event may have led to their own doom. When this time came, when Max's birthday on the winter solstice, Max and Virgil and Norman set out to try to destroy Skullmaster. The chase led on from Virgil and Norman's own home to many different places around the world, and in these different places, one place that they escaped to was Seattle, where Norman, Virgil, and Max once fought a great giant spider. But this event was foretold that this would be Norman's demise against the Great Beast. Virgil and Max attempted to escape, but Max was trying to help Norman, 
Virgil prevented him from doing so, telling him that it was Norman's time and Max could not interfere and he had to run away for, with his life. Max was infuriated and deeply saddened by this. When Virgil and Max attempted to escape Skullmaster when they found him again, Skullmaster attempted to go after Max but instead was able to bag Virgil after Max escaped to the astral plane. During there in the astral plane, Max was, was running against Talon, who he met before, and this time Skullmaster gave Max an ultimatum that he, if he would come to Stonehenge with the cap, that he would be able to save Virgil's life and spare his own as long as he would give Skullmaster the cap. Max agreed on one condition, that he would be spared as well as Virgil, and he would not go to Stonehenge alone. This time, he received help from Lava Lord. Despite Lava Lord being angry at Mighty Max for destroying his first creation, Magus, Mighty Max was able to break out a deal that would allow Max to live and help destroy Skullmaster. But the problem was Magus was already rebuilt and Lava Lord was seeking revenge on Mighty Max. But Lava Lord decided that getting revenge on Skullmaster first would be his prime idea. So what he did is him, Lava Lord, set out to Stonehenge to fight Skullmaster. Upon their arrival, a shocked Skullmaster was seemingly happy to see that the cap bearer has arrived and hoping to get the cap from him. But when Lava Lord came by, he wanted revenge. So in doing so, Skullmaster used the Crystal of Souls to raise Fuoth, an ancient Irish Gaelic mythological figure who was worshipped by the Druids on the show, to attack Magus. Although Magus won by defeating Fuoth by bombarding Fuoth with lava and destroying the creature. Skullmaster telling Lava Lord, even though he thought, thinking he was one, he really didn't know, and that the power of the Crystal of Souls would imprison Lava Lord once again. After imprisoning him, Skullmaster set his sights on Mighty Max and his cap. Skullmaster took the cap, put it on him, and then destroyed Virgil just out of pure spite. Mighty Max, enraged, was going to attempt to stop Skullmaster, but Warmonger held him back, and Skullmaster explained to Max what he had done. But before the end and the arrival of the Winter Solstice, Skullmaster turned his Crystal of Souls on Warmonger for rewarding him for his loyalty and in turn destroying Warmonger, possibly due to the events of the episode I Warmonger. However, Skullmaster told Max that he was going to kill him and it was time for him to die, but he would make his way to the center of Stonehenge to get his power. Once Max got up after being hurt by Skullmaster, he jumped onto the Crystal of Souls to stop Skullmaster. But in doing so, the power of the Crystal of Souls, the Cat Bearer, and Max was able to channel the energy that was received by Stonehenge in the Winter Solstice to go back in time and to stop Skullmaster once again, this time with help and the knowledge of the future of what's to come. Thus, they could change the future and stop Skullmaster once and for all and save his friends from certain destruction. It, this series was one that touched my heart, and it was a great series once for all to watch on my YouTube channel. Many of the episodes of this series has garnered tens of thousands of views and continues to be popular among my subscribers today. Subscribers like you have made this documentary possible, and I'm hoping that in the future that more people that would come to see this show that would love it and hopefully someone with directorial abilities would be able to remake this show into a live action film, live action TV series, or internet series, which also be preferable as well, or a, a rebooted animated series using modern technology. Either way, seeing this series come to life once again on the TV screen in perfect clarity and quality would be a dream for many of us on YouTube who watch this series. But the series began in 1993 and ended suddenly by the beginning of 1995. Its reruns were removed from all cable after 1999, and Mighty Max was supposed to be produced in a movie sometime in the 2000s, but the script never materialized, and to this day there hasn't been any plans to create a live-action version of Mighty Max, although it is possible to fund such film and series through crowdfunding. But Max will remain forever in the hearts of all of us who lived through the great times of the 90s. Its influence is felt throughout the 90s and in the early 2000s. For example, on the trail of the popular Mighty Max toy line, other companies would soup implement the miniature playset style into their merchandise for properties including Star Wars, Godzilla, Batman Forever, and these toys would such feature a character's head as an unfolded playset in the environment similar to the property at hand, such as Batman's head unfolding to reveal a Batcave. Galoob's Micro Machines line already bore a similar scale to Mighty Max and created a variety of miniature Star Wars head playsets ranging in size. Playmates also introduced many Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles playsets in 1994 and 1995. Nonetheless, in conclusion, we can all agree 
that despite Mighty Max not receiving the widespread fame that it should have received, its influence though has spread far and wide for years and remains in the hearts of all Mighty Max fans, including my own. Well, thank you for watching and thank you for subscribing. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel and click that alert button right next to it so you'd be alerted to my next video and my next documentary. The next episode of my documentary series will feature the series of Star Trek and its many canonical shows as well and movies, and I will bring the storied history to life on this channel. So stay tuned and thank you always for watching.